And a big thanks to our top tier sponsor here, T-Stud. T-Stud makes structurally insulated framing systems uh, that help reduce costs in the walls uh, and keep heat in. So make sure to check them out. And then our main session sponsor today, Panasonic, your number one source for ventilation for both new and existing homes and multifamily buildings. Panasonic features many different products to ventilate bathrooms right or for exhaust only whole house strategies including more affordable solutions, motion sensors, timers, condensation sensors, and energy recovery ventilators. The Intella Balance 100 is the International Builder Show 2017 Best of Award winner, a customizable high performance, high efficiency energy recovery ventilator that can be used in any climate to meet ASH rate 62.2. Pick a flow speed selector, it's 50 to 100 CFM, uh, customized balance, positive or negative pressure, connect to existing ductwork or use as a standalone. Uh, Merv 8 is included, but you can upgrade to 13. Um, and uh, again, exclusive ASHRAE 62.2 timing function ensures code or green building certification is met and helps uh, improve the uh, HERS index ratings. If you're looking for a cheaper balance ventilation strategy, pair a Whisper Green bath fan with a Select Cycler to bring in air through the furnace intake and exhaust it out with a bath fan. Add in a hood range pressure sensor to activate the system when makeup air is needed during cooking for your clients. All right, well, I want to welcome everybody to Can a Credit Union Break Down the Barriers to Clean Energy Financing? This course is approved for one hour in continuing education units AIBD. GBCI, Nary Green, Certified Green Professional, BPI, Non-Whole House, as well as AIA, Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable for your state-based design or contractor license. Uh, and this course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. Uh, and today I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. And uh, the lessons learned for today and what we're really going to be talking about is uh, can a credit union uh, actually be a benefit to financing uh, clean energy, uh, electric vehicle, electric infrastructure, solar, energy efficiency, and more uh, as opposed to an impediment? Is that something uh, that can be done? Um, and so I'm very excited to introduce um, our speaker today, Blake Jones. He is the co-founder and volunteer board chair for Clean Energy Credit Union, a federally charted not-for-profit and online-only financial service cooperative that provides loans solely to help consumers throughout the USA afford to pursue clean energy and energy efficiency conservation projects. Blake is also a co-founder of Namaste Solar, an employee-owned cooperative and certified B Corp based in Colorado. He began his career in 1996 working as a civil engineer for Halliburton in the oil and gas industry, and he spent three years in Nepal implementing solar, wind, hydro, and electric vehicle tech. In 2014, he returned to the USA to co-found uh, Namaste Solar, where they've installed over 5,000 solar electric systems. Blake is an Ernest and Young Entrepreneur of the Year Award recipient in 2010 and has a BE in Civil Engineering from Vanderbilt University. So with that, Blake, uh, welcome and take it away. Great, thanks. And again, we're going to talk today about can we finance clean energy movement with a credit union? I think a good place to start is maybe maybe stating the obvious or what, what the audience already is aware of, but consumers want more clean energy. We're seeing fantastic growing demand for electric vehicles, for solar electric systems, for electric bicycles for high efficiency appliances. However, and a lot of this is due to the uh, decrease in costs for those technologies. A lot of it's due to the improvement of the technologies. And regardless of what people's motivations are, some of it's energy patriotism, some of it's the environment, some of it's saving money, whatever it is, consumers want more uh, clean energy, but not everyone can afford it. A lot of clean energy projects have a large upfront cost uh, sometimes, like if you buy an electric vehicle, it can cost $35,000 instead of a conventional vehicle, that, which is much less expensive. And even if you get a federal tax credit, you've got to front that money up front. And there's an associated huge need for financing. The good news is there are financing options out there, but they tend to be too expensive. 
And part of the reason is because there's not enough competition among financiers. Most of the financiers for solar systems or energy efficiency retrofits, for example, they're venture capital backed specialty lenders. They tend not to be banks and credit unions and banks and credit unions in just about every consumer market have the lowest loan rates because they're federally insured depository institutions. So we're not seeing enough competition, particularly from those good loan, low interest rate loan providers like banks and credit unions. It's also most of the clean energy markets are, are, are new or they're perceived to be new and they do have strange dynamics. Uh, lots of uh, changes, the, the technology is changing, the, the policy issues are, are changing. And so that, that can be uh, daunting for uh, lenders to get into if they don't understand those markets. They perceive those markets to have high risk, uh, partly because they don't understand them, partly because they think the technology might be obsolete in a few years from now, uh, whatever the reasons they, they perceive them to be high risk. And then lastly, if they do get into clean energy lending, they typically want to use an existing product that they've got. Uh, there are countless number of times where someone wants to do an energy efficiency home improvement project or get a solar system and a lender will say, oh, well, we do have a home equity loan. How about you get this home equity loan? Uh, but c customers don't want to put a lien on their home. They don't want to encumber the equity in their house. And that's not a good fit, especially if it's a variable interest rate or if it's only got a five-year term. That just doesn't work if you're getting a geothermal system or a solar system or something like that. So unfortunately, not everybody can afford to get a clean energy product or service, and it's hard to find good financing. Another problem is, is that not everyone can invest in the clean energy movement. Publicly traded stocks, there aren't that many of them, uh, clean energy companies, and the ones that are, that are there uh, are notoriously volatile. They're, they're, they're scary and risky for most investors to, to take a look at. If you want to invest in a privately held company and participate in what's called a private offering and buy stock in one of these privately held companies, you're usually required to be an accredited investor. An accredited investor, basically it means that you're, you're wealthy enough. You've got a, a certain uh, income or you've got a certain uh, net worth in order to qualify as a accredited investor and then you can participate in a private offering, but that's if you're willing to take the risk if you're willing to make the high minimum investment, if you know how to do the due diligence and analyze um, the, the, the risks associated with, with, with investing in a, a privately held company. And then consumers who can't buy clean energy products and services, uh, they don't have a way to support people who can. So if you live in Manhattan or downtown San Francisco, you don't need a car, you use, you use public transportation, so you're not gonna buy an electric vehicle. Uh, you live in an apartment, so you might not uh, be getting high efficiency furnace or, or, or air conditioner or, or a solar system because you, you don't own the roof. Uh, how can they participate in the clean energy movement if they can't do so by, by using clean energy themselves? Or at the other end of the spectrum, you've got folks who already have an electric vehicle. They've got a very energy efficient home. They've got solar panels on their roof. What else can they do? They want to support other people in the clean energy movement. They want to help other people uh, walk in their footsteps, do what they've done. Uh, but how can they invest in the clean energy movement? So the, the vision is a world where everyone has the opportunity to participate in the clean energy movement. That's the vision. And I think it's an exciting one. How could we make that possible? How could we manifest that? First, we can make it easier for everyone to afford to use clean energy. And we would do that by providing customized loan offerings. So loan offerings that are custom tailored for clean energy products and services, and they would have better loan terms. So the best or among the best loan terms that you could possibly get for a clean energy project. And then the second way would be to make it easier for everyone to invest in clean energy or in the clean energy movement. And that means it's gotta be available to everyday investors, uh, non-accredited investors. You've got to have a low, low minimum threshold, as low as $5. We've got to take the risk out of it and ideally make it federally insured. That's the, the lowest uh, potential risk you can get uh, on, on the planet. And no investment expertise required. So somebody who doesn't know how to look at the financial statements or 
know whether or not an investment is a, a good idea or a bad idea or high risk or, or not. We've got we've to make it easy for folks to make that kind of decision. And I think we can do that with a credit union structure. For starters, what, what, what is a credit union? A credit union is a financial services cooperative. It provides the same financial services as a, as a bank. So you can deposit your money there. You can take loans. Uh, it's a cooperative, which means that it's democratically owned and controlled by its members. And that's on a one person, one vote basis. So only the members can run for the board of directors. The board of directors elections are by those, are, is done democratically by, by those members. Uh, it's a non-for-profit, not-for-profit and tax exempt entity. Federally chartered credit unions are 501c1 tax exempt organizations. So that's a bit about credit unions and credit unions, one big difference they have compared to a bank is that not everyone can just walk up and join a, a credit union. You've got to be in what's called the field of membership for a credit union. And a field of membership can take many different forms, and it can even be more than one of these. But some examples are if you're all employees at IBM, you could be eligible to join the IBM credit union. Uh, so employees who all work at the, at the same place. It could be people who live in the same county. It could be the Madison County Credit Union and everybody who's in Madison County is eligible to join. Could be members of the same professional association like uh, uh, dentists or realtors association or members of the same religious organization. There, there are a lot of different ways it can happen, but they're basically people who have something in common together. They're in some kind of community. It could be a virtual community that makes them eligible to join a credit union. So that's one difference between a credit union and a bank. And Whereas a bank, uh, to state maybe maybe the obvious, a bank is open to the general public. Just to remind everybody can go and, and then they're eligible to um, to get the services of a bank. Another difference, as mentioned earlier, credit unions are democratically controlled by their members. Uh, banks are controlled by stockholders in proportion to how much stock they own. Credit unions exist to serve their members, whereas a bank exists to maximize financial returns for its stockholders. Credit unions are tax exempt and not for profit. Banks are, are the opposite. Credit unions have volunteer boards of directors, whereas banks pay their boards of directors. And then the thing they have in common is they both provide the same financial services and they both have federally insured deposits with the normal disclaimer limits of up to $250,000 per person or per entity. So what we wanna do with the credit union model, what I think can be done is to take this proven model. Credit unions have been around for 100 years, and they're, they're tried and true. There's over 5,000 of them in the United States, this proven credit union model, and apply an innovative twist to it, have it focus solely on clean energy lending, and create a new model that doesn't just provide financial services and benefit members, but also benefits the environment and the economy in a different, in a different way, and then have that serve as a positive example that encourages replication. We don't want just one credit union out there doing this. We want that credit union to set a positive example and get other banks and credit unions in particular to follow suit and to see that providing loans for clean energy projects is a good idea. It's less risk than they think. It's a growing market. It's worth paying attention to and applying resources towards uh, that, that is, is the goal, and I think that can be done with this credit union model with the innovative twist. How would this new credit union be unique? Each of these things that I'm going to mention in and of itself, by itself, is not unique, but the combination of things is unique. So right now uh, in solar, for example, most of the lenders are venture capital-backed specialty lenders. It would be great to have a credit union structure that's tax exempt. You don't have stockholders that you need to make an extra markup in order to pay a return to those stockholders. You've got a cooperative trust factor. Uh, most people don't trust banks because banks, as Wells Fargo has recently shown, they care more about making a profit or meet, meeting quarterly earning statements uh, than they do about serving their customers. And they've got federally insured deposits. That's the lowest cost of funds anywhere around. Um, so banks and credit unions can take 
the money that they get from savings accounts and checking accounts where they're paying small interest rates, they can mark it up to cover their costs and they can turn around and loan it at much better rates to people who need loans than, than otherwise. Then you take an exclusive focus on clean energy lending. It's in the mission of this credit union. It'll be in the DNA of everything that it does. It'll have specific market expertise, understanding clean energy markets, paying attention to it. It'll be able to adapt to the constant twists and turns that take place with clean energy markets and the new technologies that are coming out and the policy changes, everything like that. And then I, I like to call it a, a 21st century financial institution. Uh, I love the Wayne Gretzky quote where when someone asks Wayne Gretzky, hey, what makes you so good at hockey? And he says, I don't, I don't skate where the puck is. I skate where the puck is going to be. And I think in the 21st century, say 50 years from now, most financial institutions will be online or mobile only. They won't have brick and mortar branches as they have much fewer of them. It's now so convenient to use your smartphone to, to make electronic transfers or to take a photo of, of a check and deposit it without ever having to go to the, to the bank branch. A lot of people aren't using cash anymore. Uh, if it's online and mobile only, then you don't have brick and mortar branches and brick and mortar branches are expensive. So that overhead savings, that savings and overhead expenses that, that, that results from not having brick and mortar branches, credit union can pass through those savings to its members in the form of better loan rates. That's a big advantage. And then lastly, partnerships. A credit union that specializes in clean energy lending can partner with bike shops that sell electric bicycles or dealerships that try to sell as many electric vehicles as they can or energy efficiency contractors uh, solar domestic hot water contractors, solar PV contractors, they can have those special partnerships. Those partners can know, oh wow, these guys know clean energy lending. They can provide loan products that meet my customers' needs and help my customers afford to buy those, those products from me. So it can benefit from those partnerships. So again, not any of these is, a, is, a, is unique in and of itself, but the combination of these things is very unique. Banks have a couple of these qualities. Other credit unions have a couple of these qualities. Some of the specialty financiers that are out there have a couple of these qualities. But the new credit union would have all of them. And one, to be fair, that it wouldn't have is, as a brand new credit union, people might not have heard of it before, or it may not, it may not have a known brand. It may not have any scale yet. Uh, and those things would, of course, help in, to, in, 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 in fulfilling its mission of, of growing the clean energy movement. So some potential deposit products for credit union like this, say as a startup, savings accounts and clean energy CDs, both easy to provide, a lot easier than checking accounts, you're not handling cash. It could provide those deposit products. And then in phase two, after it's gone through a startup phase, after it's got its feet underneath it, then it can start providing the full suite of deposit products like checking accounts, ATM cards, IRA accounts, health savings accounts, and things like that. In terms of loan products, in its startup phase, it could start with solar photovoltaic or solar electric loans, clean energy vehicle loans, green home improvement loans, which would include just about any energy efficiency improvement you could think of, and electric bicycle loans. Uh, in phase two, it could provide mortgages, and mortgages do require a higher level of regulatory compliance, so they're more difficult. That's why that would happen in phase two. And, but the mortgage would have to have a clean energy theme. So for a net zero energy home or a, a LEED certified home or homes that have a really ho low HERS rating, something like that, but it could provide mortgages with lower interest rates than you could find anywhere else. Uh, credit cards, uh, loans for subscriptions in community solar gardens, and then business lending. So loans and banking services to companies whose business, the nature of their business, is related to uh, growing the clean energy movement. That would be phase two for its loan products. To give some examples of loan terms that this credit union could offer, clean energy vehicles, uh, 40 miles per gallon or higher in terms of uh, EPA rated fuel efficiency, combined city highway, that would automatically include electric vehicles as well as the high, uh, highly efficient hybrids like uh, a Prius, but not the, the SUV hybrids that still only get 12 miles per gallon. It wouldn't include those. Uh, fixed rates for 
five-year term in the low threes. Right now, most vehicle loans are in the high threes. Uh, the goal would be to provide the lowest or among the lowest loan rates for electric vehicles. And then we don't just want to pay attention to new vehicles. We also want to provide used vehicle loans because the first generation of electric vehicles, the first generation of the uh, Chevy Volts and the Nissan Leafs, you know, a lot of people are selling those in order to upgrade to the newer ones that have a longer range, but we want to help people get behind the wheel of those used electric vehicles. And so we think the secondary market is very important to pay attention to and to provide good loans for those too. Solar PV systems got to have a long term in order to make sense for solar PV systems. So 12 years would be an example of a long term solar loan uh, with a good fixed interest rate that's not going to fluctuate. Uh, that would be, and then of course this would be more invaluable in a rising interest rate environment like right now. Uh, you want to have a, a shorter term loan for the 30% residential tax credit amount and have that be easy to pay back after someone files their tax return, gets a tax refund, or pays less taxes on their tax return. And instead of securing this loan with a lien on the home, secure it by the equipment, by the solar equipment itself, and file a UCC filing to, to record that. It also wouldn't be unsecured. Unsecured loans tend to have higher rates. So a good middle ground would be have it just be, have just the solar equipment be the collateral. Um, Blake, on a, on a, on a solar loan, mm -hmm. um, is the, uh, is there a way, I know one of the complaints has always been that, uh, you know, you're kind of locked into that loan and you're paying the terms, um, and the, and the tax credit, you know, can't go to, you know, pay that down. Is there a way to do that? Is there a way to, to, to what use the tax credit to pay down a loan? Well, let me say it a better way. Is there a way to use the tax credit to pay down the terms of the loan um, so they're not as, you know, not as yeah. large rather than trying to pay it down later so the terms are longer and more expensive? I, I see. Yeah, f first of all, you have to have no prepayment penalty. So all of these loans that I'm talking about, there's no prepayment penalty if somebody wants to pay it early or if they come buy some money from somewhere else and they want to, want to pay it down. There's no penalty whatsoever. And then what we've seen in the solar market is there's two ways to do it. Uh, one is the way that I'm presenting here, and that's that you have two separate loans, one for up to 70% of the project cost. That's going to be your long-term loan over 12 years, and it's going to have monthly payments that are associated with the 70% of that project cost. And then one short-term loan that's 12 or 18 months, and that's for an amount up to 30% of the project cost which coincides with the 30% tax credit. It's due in 12 to 18 months because that allows enough time for someone to file their tax returns. So if, they're, if you're getting a project installed in February, you might want an 18 month loan to give you time until the following May or June when you get a tax refund or for that tax credit or, or you just pay less in, 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 uh, in your tax liability. And then when you pay off that separate loan, you've got those lower monthly payments on the longer term loan um, that as opposed to a, a longer term loan that's for 100% of the, of the project cost. That's one way to do it. The other way to do it is have a single loan, but allow for prepayments and allow a one-time reamortization of the loan. So that's another way to do it. So when someone gets their tax credit, they can make a prepayment and then they can tell the lender, hey, I want that one-time reamortization. So the loan gets reamortized and their monthly payment goes down to reflect that prepayment. They both accomplish the same thing. Uh, there's pros and cons to each of them. We like the, the, two, the two loan system because it keeps things uh, cleaner. Great, I appreciate you explaining that because I think the second time around it, it clicked, it dawned on me. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so moving on to green home improvement loans. Uh, you can get better interest rates when they're secured and things like tankless water heaters and um, mini splits and other types of heat pumps, you can use those as collateral and just file a UCC filing, again, instead of putting a lien on the home, and that allows the interest rates to come down. You can have different terms to choose from and different amounts to keep it flexible to if somebody's doing just an, an insulation project with LED lighting, okay, that's one thing. If they're going to do 
a ground source heat pump, that's another. Um, we would probably want to increase the maximum loan amount over time, but the idea is to provide loans that allow people to do multiple green home improvements and to use those the actual improvements or what, what would exist. You can't put a, you can't use insulation and LED lights as collateral, but you can do it for the water heaters and the furnaces and the other pieces of equipment. And then unsecured clean energy loans, we'd want to bring these interest rates down over time so that someone could do an unsecured home improvement loan. But also unsecured loans are great for things like electric bicycles. Electric bicycles, it may not make sense to use that as collateral. Um, electric bicycles, you can have it covered under personal property insurance coverage of your homeowner's insurance, uh, but we want to be able to provide loans for miscellaneous things like electric bicycles. Some potential limitations of a credit union like this are, as I've already demonstrated, the, the products and services. A startup financial institution isn't going to be able to provide the full suite of products and services that a well-established bank or credit union would be able to provide. So in its startup phase, might not provide the, that, the checking accounts and that could uh, limit the amount of deposits that pe people could put into it or the amount of utility they could get out of a new, a new credit union like that. Or if it's not able to provide mortgages just yet or can't do that in its startup phase, that's, that's unfortunate, that's, that's a limitation to what this credit union could do in terms of pursuing its mission. Some other potential limitations are regulatory restrictions that startup credit unions have more regulatory oversight than larger banks and credit unions, and larger banks and credit unions already have a ton of regulatory restrictions, and that might prevent a credit union, for example, from providing loans for community solar gardens um, when community solar garden structure is still is still new and regulators are having a hard time wrapping their mind around how a loan like that would work. Another potential limitation would be lending capacity. Uh, a smaller startup credit union might not have as much lending capacity as a big bank like Bank of America. So it would need to, to grow its lending capacity and find other ways to, to work around that so that it could meet all of the loan demand for clean energy loans that are out there, especially at, at, at terms like this. So those are some poten potential limitations. It wouldn't be all uh, rainbows and, and roses at the beginning. Um, but after getting over the startup hump and proving the concept, hopefully these limitations could be addressed and removed. And then the, the good news is that this credit union exists already. Clean Energy Credit Union got its federal charter in September of 2017, and it, it launched at a soft launch at the beginning of this year and then had a full launch at the beginning of the summer. It's been making loans since May and loan demand as predicted is is fantastic. We're, multiple loan applications every day, more loan applications than, than, than we can handle, uh, great response for all the different loan types and lots of people saying, this is great, now I've got a place where I can bank or where I can, I can deposit my money that's aligned with my values. So we're, the, the vision that we had of, of trying to facilitate making it easier for everybody to participate in the clean energy movement is off to a great start. People are seeing clean energy credit union as a great way to do one or, or both of those things or participate in one or both of those ways in the clean energy movement. We are hoping to scale up as quickly as we possibly can and roll out those additional products and services that I mentioned earlier. Um, so, so, so far, so good. We are off to a fantastic start and we're excited to spread the word. And that was it for, for what I had prepared. Uh, I would love to, to talk shop or, or answer questions if anybody in the audience uh, has them. Thanks, Blake. Yeah, we've definitely got plenty of time here for questions. I've got several questions uh, on my mind that I'd like to go over, but I want to make sure everybody else gets a chance. And as you all are typing your questions in right now, uh, just real quick, um, big thanks again to uh, all of our main sponsors, T-Studs, Structurally Insulated Framing Systems in the Walls, um, uh, Mitsubishi, uh, All Electric HVAC to help drive your projects down to zero energy, and Shrinergy um, with both on the go and uh, uh, in, in your client's home or even community microgrid solutions. So make sure to check them all out. 
Thanks to our sponsors, our board of directors, our members, our volunteers, and all of you for joining us. Um, we couldn't do uh, this without you. So uh, let's see, we're still waiting for questions to be typed in uh, right now, Blake. So it looks like uh, maybe I'll just uh, uh, start, the, start the process here. Um, one of the questions I have is, is this also available for uh, multifamily or small commercial at all? Not, not yet. I think the when we roll out residential mortgages, um, I, I think if someone's in a in a condo or a multifamily unit, um, I think a residential mortgage for something like that is doable. And then commercial is something we want to do maybe in late 2019 to provide not just commercial real estate loans, but also uh, commercial revolving lines of credit, working capital loans for businesses that, that do clean energy, or uh, a business that just wants to do energy efficiency retrofits or put solar on the roof of, of its office or warehouse building. So we can't do that today, but we're hoping to be able to do that in 2019 as we as we get our get established and roll out more products and services. And just to be clear right now, you are in uh, in phase one. Correct. We're in phase one startup phase. Yep. And um, the, 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 the good news is I think when a lot of people think of startups, they think, oh, there might be some risk associated with this organization or with this business. Um, we are heavily regulated and we in some ways have a, a seal of approval from the federal government in that we've got our federal charter and all anyone who deposits money in clean energy credit union it's it's federally insured up to two hundred fifty thousand dollars and the lending that we're doing there's such strict regulatory oversight that there's not any concern about that either that if you were to get a loan from clean energy credit union it can't be it can't be taken away from you or anything like that so being a startup federally chartered credit union is different than being a startup business for example but it does translate to by being a startup we like most startups got to learn to crawl before you walk and you got to learn to walk before you run and as a startup it's in the crawl phase so it doesn't yet have all of the products and services we want to have mm -hmm. um and just clarify again uh where 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 this would be available yes this is all 50 states anywhere in the united states so as a federally chartered credit union instead of a state chartered credit union Mm -hmm. um, members can be anywhere. Mm -hmm. The loans can be provided anywhere in the United States, and, th and that's what we're seeing so far. Mm -hmm. We've already got over 350 members uh, signed up in just the past few months, and they're from they're from all over the United States. And okay. same thing with the loan applications. And since there's no brick and mortar branches, there's not a, a need to to know where the the the, the nearest ATM machine is or or, or branch. Everything can be done um, right. on on online. Uh, mm -hmm. Our smartphone app is being released mm -hmm. this this month, and they will join what's called the the, the co-op shared network. It's credit unions allow other credit unions to members to use their ATM machines and to use their branches. We're going to do the same thing. So that if somebody absolutely needs to go to a branch and talk with someone, or if they want to get a withdrawal from an ATM machine, they'll mm -hmm. be able to use that mm -hmm. network of 40,000 ATM machines of other credit unions throughout the country. Mm -hmm. um, are you seeing an interest in duplication of your concept or, or maybe another way to word it is, uh, is anyone else around doing this? There are a few credit unions that deserve a lot of, a lot of credit, no, no <laughs> intended, uh, that, that have been doing this. So there's some uh, like the Puget Sound Cooperative Credit Union up in the Northwest, the Vermont State Employees Credit Union up in the Northeast. They have uh, a Provident Credit Union in Southern California is another one. They're very progressive credit unions that have been, that have taken the time and energy to learn about clean energy markets and to provide good customized loan products that meet the market's needs. Mm -hmm. But it's only a handful. So out of the 5,000 plus credit unions in the United States, maybe there's a dozen or a half a dozen that are doing this. But a few of them, a few of them are. There's mm -hmm. also uh, a few um, progressive banks like certified B Corp banks like uh, New Resource Bank in California, or I think it's called First Green Bank down in Florida. But again, uh, you know, less than 0.1%, like bar barely even noticeable. 
And that means there's a tremendous opportunity to get the others on board. And we are seeing a ton of, of interest. We're getting, uh, we're, having, we're having calls with credit unions about every other week uh, because they're interested in what we're doing and they want to learn what we're doing. They want to learn how we're doing it. And so one of the ways in which we would consider it a failure if 10 years from now, Clean Energy Credit Union is the only one doing this. Uh, so part of our goal, part of our mission is to teach other financial institutions how to do this and to get comfortable with creating the exact same uh, loan products and providing it to their customers and to their members. And we're going to do that a couple different ways. Some of it can be done with just educational classes, uh, some of it can be done at presentations at credit union conferences, but also there's there's something called loan participations, which might be might be in the weeds, but it allows credit union other credit unions to basically buy into and invest in some of the loan portfolios, clean energy loan portfolios that clean energy credit union has, and they can they can get some experience um, with all the paperwork, with how the loans work. They can get some develop some of their own track record uh, because they'll be a part owner or part investor in such loan pools. Um, and we're really excited about loan participations, and we're seeing a ton of interest from other credit unions mm -hmm. in doing loan participations in our clean energy loan pools. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I um, I just wanted to kind of add to that question um, and then also kick that off with another question. In, um, so, you know, I've been going around and talking to credit unions here in West Michigan, and it's kind of like, you know, when you ask them, can you do this, the answer is always yes. But then when you start getting into the weeds, um, it's really more like, yeah, but we're going to make it very complicated for you and require an appraisal and all of this. Um, but anyway, there is an organization called Michigan Saves here in Michigan, and I think Indiana has something similar. But it's very interesting, and they work mostly with credit unions to make this kind of thing happen. And, um, you know, one of the things we were able to do, and this is getting into my question, Blake, is we had a, a, an, in, an individual building their own home to lead platinum standards. Uh, and they wanted solar and geothermal, um, and they, you know, just could not um, get the lender to, to uh, you know, give them enough to add on those other pieces. And just so you know, those are not required to hit lead platinum. It's just they wanted to get to zero energy uh, ready as well. Um, and so they actually used Michigan State through a credit union to fund the solar and the geothermal. And so I guess my question to you, Blake, is, can this be used during the new construction process when the when the mortgage falls short, or has it been? Yeah. Yeah. We just started doing our first new construction loans. Yep. And that that that's been exciting. Um, it, it does it does make sense. You know, put, putting myself in the in the homeowner's shoes, it would be great to be able to roll that into the mortgage because then it's amortized over up to 30 years and there's mm -hmm. fantastic historically low mortgage rates to benefit from. But if the mortgage lender isn't willing to do that, which sometimes they're not, then yes, they can get a second loan from Clean Energy Credit Union to do it. When Clean Energy Credit Union starts providing mortgages, that's one of the easy ways in which we're hoping to be different is we'll understand all those add-ons and what they are and we'll work with the homeowner to roll those into the mortgage so that in a lead platinum home, that would be the perfect kind of of home, especially if it's net zero energy for clean energy credit union to want to provide a mortgage for. And mm -hmm. the goal is for that to be at a lower interest rate than they could get from any other mortgage provider. Mm -hmm. So keeping on that topic, just, you know, thinking of your phase two, um, I mean, for the, I guess the first question is, you know, would those mortgages potentially be able to be refinanceable uh, mortgages for people who have existing homes? And then second is, you know, will you be using any kind of energy modeling to consider the dollar per month saved with the trade-off of the increase in mortgage to ensure that it's, you know, nearly nearly the same? Yep. Yeah, that, that's exactly how we're going to justify to the other banks and credit unions that we're trying to recruit mm -hmm. um, wh why these kinds of loans deserve better loan terms or why they're not nearly as risky as they mm -hmm. currently perceive them to be because mm -hmm. you're exactly right. You've got lower utility bills uh, and those savings then make it easier for you to service the debt on a loan, whereas that does not exist if you're just doing a, a kitchen remodel or adding a bathroom or getting a, a you know gas guzzling SUV, you, th those things are those things are not true of, of non clean energy loans. So while sometimes we may not be doing the exact calculations because um, clean energy credit union already knows that, that that 
that's what's in play here, we might start doing the calculations just as a way to help build a more uh, case study data to prove or to demonstrate to other financial institutions that we're trying to recruit that, hey, look, look, look what this translates to. This home, here's how cheap it is to live in. Compared to another home of its size, it's saving $3,000 a year in utility bills. And then you compare that to what the monthly mortgage payment is. That's, that's, a, pretty, that's a pretty significant uh, benefit for, for debt service. Um, thanks. So next question is, who would file the UCC1 filing, the credit union? Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty easy to do um, in all 50 states. Uh, I think all 50 states, there's there's online Secretary of State website where you can make that UCC filing. It, it, it usually mm -hmm. takes five minutes, for, but the credit union does it for uh, on behalf of the member. The member doesn't have to worry about it. Mm -hmm. Clean Energy Credit Union also files that UCC filing at the county level. It actually isn't... Um, uh, it doesn't have any, that's the right way to say it, the real, the real UCC filings at the Secretary of State level, but we file it at the county level so that it shows up if someone tries to sell their, their home. Um, it doesn't, we've specifically put on there, this UCC filing is not a lien on the home to let, uh, say if somebody wants to refinance their first mortgage, the new mortgage provider would see that and say, oh, okay, this isn't a lien on the home, it's just a lien on the, on the solar equipment or on the uh, ground source heat pump. Um, but we do file it at the county level just so that it shows up in a title search. Um, and this next question, it kind of pegs back into what I was talking about a little bit, but more specifically, um, you know, the question is how, how do you work with FERS raters? But uh, I do know on, on the reports they pull, they actually have a, a mortgage um, document they can pull on energy savings within the mortgage. Is that anything you've looked at or considered working with the REM rate on? Not, not yet, but that's exactly the kind of thing we want to do. So like we, you know, we have our standard now for clean energy vehicles. Um, in, in this case, it was relatively easy. It's just a, you know, the EPA gives a fuel efficiency rating for all automobiles. We just take a look at that. And if the combined city highway rating is above 40 miles per gallon, okay, that qualifies for one of our clean energy loans. For energy efficiency improvements, we've got a list on our website of all the different appliances and improvements that you could do and it's just it's got eligibility you know what what percent rating the furnace has to be in order to be qualified we we, we the energy star rating was easy to piggyback on if anything's energy star rated we'll, we'll go ahead and provide a loan for that but for homes it's going to be a little more more complicated there there is energy star rating for homes there's um lead certification i know there's 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 other ones but we want to be more versatile in allowing somebody who has done some energy modeling and has a hers rating so we'll probably have a hers rating threshold that if you're lower than than xyz then then you qualify for that and y you would need to provide the associated paperwork or, or, or proof that that's the case um so and i think this next question here stems out of some of the things that are cropping up from the uh, what they call our pace or the property assessed clean energy movement specifically to the residential sector not the commercial sector uh, and so the question is are you taking a subordinate lien on the property to do the financing so the answer is yes um, but it's subordinate but it's not even a lien on the property so the ucc filing is a is a lien on the equipment the whether it's the energy efficiency appliance or the hot water heater or the solar panels. So it, yeah, it's not a, it's kind of an apples to oranges thing. It's not a lien on the property and there's no need to worry about it being subordinate to a, a PACE loan. Um, but as, as the audience might, might know, pay, residential PACE programs ran into problems about 10 years ago because you know, right when they were doing so much good after the economic downturn, because mortgage providers, particularly banks, did not want their first mortgage to be subordinate to the property tax lien that comes with PACE. So there are a lot of mortgage providers who are concerned about being subordinate to a PACE loan. A lot of them won't do it. It and unfortunately killed or, or delayed a lot of residential PACE programs throughout the country. Uh, for our first loans, that, that just won't be an issue because we're not, we're not we're just going to have a lien on the equipment. When we start providing mortgages, because it's in our mission, because we understand the dynamics of PACE, yes, our mortgages will be just fine. We're okay with them being subordinate to PACE loans if somebody wanted to get a PACE loan in addition to uh, a mortgage from us. 
How does the loan application approval process vary from a typical home improvement home equity loan? Well, with home equity loans, there's the layperson's way of saying it is there's a heck of a lot more paperwork. And I think, Brett, you mentioned earlier, you've, you've got to get an appraisal, for example. Um, those things are just, they're more onerous, they take more time, um, they're more expensive for the, the lender to do because there's a whole lot of regulatory compliance requirements. And yeah, it's, it's, it's tougher to do those. Uh, with our loan application process, it's relatively much quicker. So imagine applying for a car loan. Uh, if you're applying to, for a, a solar loan or an energy efficiency home improvement loan, it's it's like applying for a car loan as opposed to uh, the extra steps you have to take when you're applying for a second mortgage or a home equity line of credit where you've got to get an appraisal and you've got to fill out a ton of paperwork. We just this month, uh, we're launching our online loan application portal. So right now we're doing it via DocuSign. You can go to our website, you can fill out a web form um, that's pretty simple, and that alerts us to send you a, an electronic loan application. Uh, but soon, instead of the web portal, it'll be, you fill everything in on that web portal. It'll be a very secure web portal. And if you qualify for the loan, it'll let you know instantaneously. If, if you've got a great FICO score, if you've got um, you know, qualifying debt to income, it'll let you know immediately. If there's something that needs a little more uh, research, it'll let you know, and then we'll have our team look at it and get back to you in a day or two. Um, but that, that is coming soon, and we think that because we don't have branches and we have to do everything electronically, that, that pushes us to make sure we've got the best possible software to make this easy, and this, this new online loan application portal is gonna be, is gonna be fantastic. We're really excited to, to roll it out. That'll help facilitate loan applications for sure. Um, you know, uh, besides energy uh, efficiency and solar and vehicles, you know, obviously uh, saving water uh, both saves energy, but also saves money unless you're, you know, off, uh, uh, you're off on well water or something. Uh, um, so is there opportunity for water? And then adding to that, um, what about, you know, health improvements? Because, you know, once you tighten a home up, uh, you could cause potential health issues if, if, if uh, ventilation is not addressed. Yeah, so like an energy recovery, you know, ventilation system. Yeah, that, that's a great example. I I actually don't know off the top of my head if we have if we have that on our list of eligible um, projects. If if it's not on there, it should be. Mm -hmm. The water saving one is a, is a is a fun one. I know we have tankless water heaters on the list, but I'm not sure if we have. I, I don't think we yet have you know, ir irrigation systems or, or other things that can help that can help save water. So um, that's a really good question. And I think that's a place where we can evolve. But if you go to our website to find that that list, which is under, um, you know, borrow from us on our on our loan products, you'll be able to go to it. Uh, you, you, you may not find as expansive of a list as we hope to have, say, a, a year from now after we get out of the the crawl phase or out of the startup phase. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, if whoever uh, asked that question, uh, my email address is on the screen. If you've got some suggestions or some, some, some specific ad advice uh, or even general advice, we, we, would, we would love to hear it because uh, right now uh, in our team of about 15 volunteers and, and on our team of staff, we don't have any uh, water saving experts or geeks and uh, that'll be good for us to, to round out um, what, our existing knowledge with some, some better knowledge of, of water saving opportunities. Thanks, Blake. Um, so the other question uh, that came up here is uh, offsets. Um, you know, obviously with energy being saved on the efficiency side, there potentially could be uh, carbon offsets generated. And then on the, obviously on the solar side, renewable energy credits is is there any thought around how those could be generated or used? Yes, we take them into account when we see someone applying for a big solar loan mm -hmm. in a market that doesn't have other incentives, but where they're able to sell their solar renewable energy credits, their solar recs. We can take that into account when underwriting their loan. We haven't yet, and we've had a couple of requests 
uh, about ways to provide loans that are securitized or that use the carbon offsets of the REXIS collateral. Um, that might be another example of, of a loan type that we want to do. We want to adapt with the market and, and help enable those markets, but we haven't, we, haven't, we haven't cracked the code yet. I would say the same thing with the community solar garden uh, subscription loans. Uh, you know, we could just provide an unsecured loan for somebody who wants to buy a share in a community solar garden, but we're, we're going to want to do something better with better terms, and we're still, uh, still brainstorming that and seeking feedback on that. So whoever asked that, if they've got some uh, feedback or advice or even some examples, if they see someone else doing something innovative, we, we would love to know so that we can, we can do that too. Great, thanks. Um, See if we've got any other questions here. Um, I, I mean, any any considerations on um, um, you know taking homes that want to maybe fuel switch over to all electric? There seems to be some reports coming out uh, where there's a lot of potential savings to be had going all electric. Is there is that anything you consider? Or is it just more like whatever the payment is and whatever the savings are? Yeah, no, we we have thought about that a lot. You know, a lot of net zero energy homes, um, that's the approach they take. Make make it all electric, and then um, you know the ground source heat pump and all electric appliances, and then meet all those needs through um, through solar or a, or a small wind turbine or something like that. So I think we're we're aware of that strategy. Uh, we've even gone to the point of thinking like, should uh, induction stoves, um, which are really efficient and uh, great alternatives to electric ranges um, for cooking in an all electric uh, or net zero energy home. Uh, you know, can, can we include those you know, in, in our loans because they, they help enable a, a broader strategy like that. So we thought a lot about it. Um, didn't know if there was a specific question about, about uh, you know, a particular loan we could provide, but, but yeah, that's th those things are on our mind and we're, we're seeking feedback from our members and from our fellow clean energy geeks on, on, on how to approach those. I think when we're, we're talking to a couple of net zero energy home builders, of which there aren't a ton, but there are some that only build net zero energy homes, they're, they're going to be a great source of feedback for, um, you know, what, what the, the strategies that they incorporate and making sure we can, of course, provide a mortgage to handle the entire home that includes all those things in it, but also what about folks who are doing it, um, you know, add-on, or, or, or maybe, they're, maybe they're refinancing and they have those things in their home. Uh, and, and, I, and I don't know if I answered the earlier question about refinancing. The, 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 the answer is yes. We do want to help be, if someone wants to refinance their home and wrap um, their conventional mortgage and their solar loan into a refinanced mortgage, we're, we're going we're gonna to look at that. That's the kind of thing we want to help with. If someone wants to refinance their existing electric vehicle, we've got fantastic rates for refinancing that electric vehicle. Uh, we're even now looking at refinancing um, existing solar systems. There's a lot of people who have some really high rate solar loans out there, and we would love to help them make some, some lower payments. Mm -hmm. um, and, and now that I mentioned it, we're, we're looking at some off-grid uh, uh, solar loans too, and, and and battery loans and everything like that. Uh, hmm. But sorry, sorry for the tangent. Yeah. No, no, I was going to ask about batteries. That's helpful. Um, so I see you've got um, you know some terms for energy efficiency and some better terms, obviously, for solar and you know geothermal or ground source heat pumps, uh, as it's really called, um, kind of fall in the middle. I mean, clearly, it's not a renewable energy. It doesn't actually generate energy. Um, but it is something that typically has a little bit of a longer term payback um, because of the higher upfront costs. Is there, um, is that just normally fall in your energy efficiency loans or how, how would you finance GEO? Yeah, currently that falls in our, our green home improvement loans or energy efficiency loans. Uh, that's the easiest way to do it right now. We are in discussions with uh, a manufacturer of ground source heat pump equipment and trying to learn more about it. And we want to take what we've learned and take it to regulators and say, hey, we, we want to provide a, a similar customized loan like we have for, for solar PV. I think the same thing for, for solar thermal. We're, we're still seeing a lot of solar thermal happening in California and Florida and some, some demand by those contractors to provide better loans to mm -hmm. their customers. So right now, solar thermal, or solar domestic hot water uh, and ground source heat pumps 
currently fit under in, in our bucket for green home improvement loans is a short answer, but we do want to take a look at can we create a customized loan offering just for those. Some of it too is also getting wrapping our minds around what the, what the demand would be. So does it, does it make sense? Are we going to be seeing uh, thousands of those or hundreds of those or dozens of those? And that can, that can help steer us towards whether or not we make a, a customized separate standalone loan product just for those. And um, my understanding, by the way, is that both of those examples, the ground source heat pumps and the solar domestic hot water are eligible for 30% tax credit too. So that's, that's a consideration we want to we want to keep in mind for the the, the people who are, who are who are buying those, right? Like the like the two part financing strategy, kind of. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, unless there's any more questions, uh, the last one here. Um, you know, I, obviously, I see you are uh, volunteering your time as the board chair, but the question is, you know, how large is a is a staff to how long, how many people does it take to run a clean energy credit union? Right. Right now we've got three staff people and about 15 volunteers. And some of the volunteers, uh, like me, we're, we're dedicating a, a significant amount of time. I'm spending maybe 20 hours a week on this. Um, so it's very much a roll up your sleeves board and roll up your sleeves volunteer team, um, mostly uh, former clean energy executives and credit, credit union executives. The, the number of staff that we need is significantly less because we don't have branches and we're not handling cash yet. We're not. Um, doing checking accounts. Those are, are very people intensive, even when you've got uh, highly automated and software based processes. Mm -hmm. We are actively seeking uh, new recruits, like we're, we're hiring a loan officer because we're, we've got so many loan applications and we hope to hire uh, as quickly as we can in the, in the next in the next year to, to help us ramp up. But the good news is most of our processes are highly automated. And so it means that say when we reach uh, 100 million in assets, if you compare us to another bank or credit union with 100 million in assets, we're going to have far fewer people simply because we don't have we don't have branches and we don't need tellers and we're doing everything electronically or over the phone. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and by the way, to connect the dots that if, that, you know, how, why should a why should a potential borrower or depositor care? Well, it's because if the credit union has less in, in overhead expenses, it doesn't need to mark up the interest rate as much from what it what it gets from the savings accounts and checking account deposits, uh, and it can pass through those savings to borrowers in the form of, of better loan rates. And we are hoping to improve our loan rates whenever we can and whenever we recognize those cost savings uh, when we roll out new new features, new products and services. Well, um, Blake, uh, we're at our time here, and I don't see any other questions, so I really appreciate you um, joining us and, and taking us through this. And just real quick before we wrap up, uh, where can people find out more information and contact you with further questions? Yeah, the, the, the best place to go is our website. It's up there on the screen, screen but it's cleanenergycu.org, and the CU, of course, stands for credit union, so cleanenergycu.org. And then my uh, email address is on the screen as well, but it's blake.jones at mm. cleanenergycu.org. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Thanks again, Blake. Take care. Have a rest of the good rest of your week. Thanks, Brett.